Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 27 Part 2 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we continue the deep dive into October of 1968. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. Plus, stay tuned for bonus pictures of the Ron Raffaelli Electric Church photo shoot at the end of the video. Between Monday the 14th and Wednesday the 16th of October, Jimi Hendrix is involved in the air apparent sunrise sessions being held at TTG Studios in Hollywood. TTG Studios were a compact facility on a quiet side street in the long-established industrial area south of Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards. TTG concentrated on sound, and was minus any rock star decor or perks. Hendrix author John McDermott noted, The air apparent sessions were difficult, unlike experienced sessions, where the roles of everyone involved, albeit unspoken, were defined. Hendrix began to dominate both engineering and producing chores. Linda Eastman, who was on hand to take photographs, can talk of the tension caused by Hendrix's encroachment upon Eddie Kramer's duties. The two started bickering, something they had never done in the past. While on Tuesday the 15th of October, back in Los Angeles, the experience listened to the Winterland recordings. Wednesday the 16th of October sees the release of the double LP Electric Ladyland by Reprise Records in the USA. While in Los Angeles, California, Jacoba Atlas interviews Jimi Hendrix at Benedict Canyon, Hollywood for Teen Set, published February 1969. Later that day, Jimmy reportedly jammed with Cream bassist Jack Bruce at TTG Studios in Hollywood, with Buddy Miles on drums and Jim McCarty on guitar. Songs performed during the jam session were Sunshine of Your Love, I Just Want to Make Love to You and Others. Jack Bruce recalled, I went there, but it was so chaotic I didn't stay very long. It was just off the strip somewhere. There were loads of people there. There were too many people to even know who they were. It was just chaos, just not something very worthwhile at all. You can't really tell who's who because people were swapping instruments. It was not a good thing. But it was nice to see him. He signed an album, Electric Ladyland, and gave it to me. It says, To Jack, love and happiness to you forever. I appreciate you. Stay yourself. Stay you. Jimi Hendrix. Friday the 18th of October. The single, All Along the Watchtower and B-Side Long Hot Summer Night, was released in England on track records. While at TTG Studios, the experience works on recordings for Isabella and Messenger. Noel goes on to recount the following event. During the Watchtower period, Mitch and I got a tip-off that some girls had put the police onto us. It wasn't too surprising. Jimmy had tried to beat up a girl in my room, and Eric Barrett and I had grabbed him and thrown him out. Jimmy went outside and carried on beating up on her. Tipped off that the cops were on their way, Mitch and I cleaned the house, and when Jimmy failed to show up, we went in to tackle his room. The state of it knocked us out. We found an amazing amount of an amazing number of substances in every pocket, every drawer, on the floor, under the bed, in the bed. I was expected a sizable stash, but this was preposterous. We gathered it all up and buried it in the garden. The squad arrived, and we were clean. All the experience needed was a drug bust on top of an assault complaint. While John McDermott, in his biography of Hendrix, noted, Jimmy was fast becoming destructive in many ways, while in Los Angeles, he had fought with a groupie, hitting her in the face with a brick, her cuts requiring stitches. The incident cost Hendrix dearly in an out-of-court settlement, but money was easy. He would spend a small fortune on stereo equipment or televisions or on shopping sprees for girlfriends. In one weekend, he contrived to buy nine guitars. His expenses were staggering, and as guitars were treated as a group expense, Mitchell and Redding were responsible for half the cost. They too were not exactly maintaining a low profile at this time, wholeheartedly enjoying the various fruits of their hard labor. Also around this period, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following publications. Berkeley Barb, October 18th edition, and It International, October 18th edition. Saturday the 19th of October, Jimi and Mitch attend Cream's farewell concert at the Los Angeles Forum. Sharon Lawrence, in her biography of Hendrix, recounts, I sat with a friend in the audience of the Forum in Inglewood, California, to catch the Cream Farewell Tour. I looked around, and a few rows to my right, I observed Jimi Hendrix, Mitch Mitchell, and George Harrison sitting out front with the fans. 
As many in the crowd of 18,000 came to realize this, the excitement in the arena built to fever pitch. She continues, Russ Shaw, an effervescent young promotion man from Jimmy's record label, approached me. Sharon, do you see how they're reacting to Hendrix? Even when he's just sitting, isn't this fabulous? We grinned in fellowship because seeing stars happen was one of the things that was so wonderful about living in L.A. in the late 60s. Later in the evening, Jimmy participates in a jam session with Lee Michaels organist, Mick Cox, guitarist heir apparent, at the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles, after a party at Benedict Canyon. There also reports that Jimmy participates in a jam session with Paul Revere and the Raiders, and Lee Michaels organist, at RCA Victor Studios in Hollywood. While photographs capture Carmen Barrero in Jimmy's arms, Carmen was a waitress Jimmy had met at the Whiskey A Go Go, who was a former Playboy Club bunny. A stunning Puerto Rican blonde, she soon became his favorite companion. Also around this time, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music publications. Top Pops, October 19th to 25th edition. Record Mirror, October 19th edition. Disc and Music Echo, October 19th edition. New Musical Express, October 19th edition, and Melody Maker, also October 19th edition. Sunday, the 20th of October. Early that morning, Jimmy crashes his Corvette, according to Mitch. One Saturday night, we went to see Cream, and we had a party back at the house. The party didn't break up until five, and at about seven, when I'd just got off to sleep, I heard Jimmy's voice. Guess what? I've just crashed my car. I thought I was dreaming and went back to sleep. Several hours later, I discovered that it was true. How the hell he survived, I have no idea. He completely demolished the car. Luckily, he turned right and gone into some rocks. If he'd gone left, he'd have gone straight over the edge of the canyon, a 300-foot drop. Monday, the 21st of October, and Jimmy has the Electric Church Jam recording session, TTG Studios, with Buddy Miles on drums, Lee Michaels on organ, and an anonymous harmonica player. This is the first time that we see Jimmy in photographs using the white Gibson SG guitar. Also on the same day, it is reported that Jimmy has a studio jam with Zoat Money and Andy Summers. Around October 21st. At TTG Studios, Jimmy is visited by Harvey Gerst, a representative of the Bartel Company, which was the first manufacturer of the Black Widow acoustic guitar. Like Hendrix, Gerst was a left-handed guitarist who worked with many bands of the 60s, such as The Birds, Sweetwater, The Doors, Janis Joplin, Dylan and Zappa. As Harvey said, I met Jimmy at the Oakland airport and asked him, Do you like The Black Widow? He said, I love it. Tuesday, the 22nd of October, Mr. Lost Soul and Look Over Yonder, a.k.a. Mr. Badluck, were recorded at TTG Studios. Later, Jimmy and Mitch participate in a jam session with Carol Kay on bass, According to Mitch, Jimmy and I jammed with Carol Kay, the bassist who did a lot of sessions with Motown after moving to Los Angeles. She was brilliant. It blew my mind. Also, on the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in The Heights, October 22nd edition. Wednesday, 23rd and Thursday, the 24th of October, Peace in the Mississippi and New Rising Sun are recorded at TTG Studios with Lee Michaels on keyboards and an unknown player on harmonica. This is the first known session where Jimmy uses a black Fender Strat. Friday the 25th of October, Jimmy plays bass with Robert Wyatt on Slow Walking Talk, which is recorded at TTG Studios, with the vocalists from Sweet Inspirations and Dave Mason participating in the recording sessions. The day is also notable as Jimmy buys a 1969 Silver Corvette Cortez, while across the Atlantic, Electric Ladyland is released by Track Records in the UK to controversy over Track's choice of the Naked Women cover art. According to photographer David Montgomery, the photo of naked girls was David King's idea. It was prepared at the last minute. They went to a nightclub the night before and told all these girls they would get paid three pounds and meet Jimi Hendrix if they took their tops off for a photo shoot the following day. The art director knew Jimi wasn't going to be there as he was in America, and when we started with the knickers, you know, we'll give you an extra two pounds. So for the extra money, they all took their knickers off too. We probably shot that in an hour, and it was the end. I have to say I was a little young and a little scared of all those girls without clothes. Also that day, 
The Jimi Hendrix Experience is featured in The Los Angeles Free Press, October 25th to 31st edition. Saturday the 26th of October sees the Jimi Hendrix Experience performing at the Civic Auditorium, Bakersfield, California, Partial Setlist, Foxy Lady, Red House, Stone Free, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, Star Spangled Banner, and Purple Haze. Hendrix Concert in Bakersfield, The Stuff of Legend, an excerpt from the Bakersfield News. The world was changing fast in 1968, from black and white to kaleidoscopic, and popular music was not just riding the wave, it was propelling it. And so it was against this swirling, almost surreal, historical backdrop that thousands of young people, buzzing with anticipation and who knows what else, poured into the Bakersfield Civic Auditorium on October 26, 1968, to experience one of the most exciting and incendiary musical acts ever to enter the city limits, the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Seeing Mitch Mitchell nail his drums to the floor was a precursor of things to come, recalls Sonny Lackey, who would later come to be known as Sonny California, harmonica player, percussionist and vocalist with Big House, and numerous other musical acts. The aspiring musician was just 16 when Hendrix trilled his first note that night, but he wasn't quite the same when he left a couple of hours later. After the obligatory wait, he remembers, Jimmy took a long toke stage right, flicked the roach at the civic manager, and plugged in his strat to a wall of sun amps. He turned his guitar volume control up as he walked to the front of the stage, trilling the fretboard, and did the splits for the intro to Foxy Lady. It was otherworldly. The Civic was packed with mostly white kids, who were there to see the world's top touring act, a black American guitar wizard backed by two British musicians, bassist Noel Redding and drummer Mitch Mitchell. The night would later take on the characteristics of local legend, complete with competing and contradicting recollections and versions. Rumours and stories surrounding what happened after the power was cut off by management remain to this day. But the man who had been hand-picked by Hendrix to document his American tour was on stage and backstage with Hendrix all that night shooting photos, and he is happy to put to rest some 47-year-old stories. Despite differences in the way people remember that night, no one disputes the power and historical significance of Hendrix's performance in an oil and ag town that had come to be known as Nashville West. Mitch Gordon was only 14 when he and his friend Dave Freeman settled in about five rows back from the stage. Gordon, a budding guitarist, and Freeman, a drummer, would both go on to play music professionally. Hendrix had already become a well-established, larger-than-life cultural icon and an unrivaled musical phenomena, Gordon recalls. The anticipation of seeing Jimi Hendrix and the experience was so great, I hardly remember the opening band. When Jimi and the fellas finally hit the stage, it seemed like the audience was almost stunned at first. Everyone was kind of reserved and mesmerized. It was like nobody knew how to act. I don't think the majority of us had ever seen anything or anyone like that, he says. That's one of the reasons it was a life-changing event for me and so many others. This was completely new territory. It was as if Hendrix had come to town to provide 3,000 teenagers with a rite of passage, not just into adulthood, but into a new universe. Together, Hendrix, Redding and Mitchell were somehow able, through the power of music, to tear a hole in the sky and show an auditorium full of fresh-faced teens, something beyond the conventional reality that had been taught to them at home and at school. From the moment Jimmy cranked up the experience, the sound coming off the stage was astonishing. Immediate jaw-dropping, proof positive that the immensity of Hendrix's talents had not been overstated, recalls Eric Griffin, who was just 15 at the time. Guitarist, keyboardist, vocalist Terry Houston, who is still active in Bakersfield musical venues, was in his senior year at Garces High School when he saw Hendrix at the Civic. He had previously seen the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl in 66, and rates that concert slightly higher than the Hendrix event, but only slightly. Hey, it was the Beatles, after all, he says, laughing. Hendrix was magical, mesmerizing, Houston remembers. His command of his instrument and the astonishing sounds he was able to pull from it without a rack of pedals and effects was amazing. I'm so grateful I grew up in that era. The music and the movement was unlike anything that came afterward. Hendrix, Gordon says, was an incredibly charismatic showman. But more importantly, he was an unbelievably gifted, innovative and virtuosic guitar player. I mean, who even knew you could do that? especially in person without the benefit of overdubbing and studio effects, he says. It opened up an entire universe of new possibilities 
and raised the bar into the stratosphere, the stratocastosphere. The other amazement, which I don't remember giving too much credence to at the time, is that he was a black man performing in a certifiably bigoted, redneck town, playing to an almost exclusively white teenage audience, Gordon remembers. Tensions must have been high among community leaders. It's no wonder some shit came down. I remember feeling frustrated, ashamed, and embarrassed by the negative events that unfolded. Indeed, the show ended in anticlimax, when it is believed, the general manager of the Civic Auditorium cut the power to the stage. At the time, I thought that the amplifiers had merely failed, but apparently, it was a premeditated act of aggression, resulting in an altercation between Jimmy and the powers that be, Gordon recalls. I've heard varying accounts with some saying that they spent the night trying to get him out of jail, and others claiming that it was all settled backstage with a bribe. Either way, more than a few people have told me that they saw Jimi Hendrix, with his girlfriend, in a new Corvette at the Jumbo Burger on Golden State Avenue after the concert, and that he was super friendly and personable before driving off into the night. The story of the confrontation with the manager of the Civic and the subsequent involvement of the Bakersfield Police Department have become the stuff of legend, as has the prosaic visit by Hendrix to a local burger joint before flying, er, uh, driving off into a rock star lit night. Ron Raffaelli, who has dozens of album covers and thousands of rock star portraits and performance photos to his credit, was chosen by Hendrix to photograph the band's epic American tour in 1968 and 69. And while there's no way to tell nearly five decades after the event exactly which stories are accurate, Raffaelli's account is fairly convincing as he was with Hendrix before, during, and after the Bakersfield performance. Jimmy was a consummate showman, Raffaelli remembers. A lot of rock groups have no connection with their audience. They just stand up there and play. Jimmy's heartbeat was part of them. Their heartbeat was part of him, he says. It was electric. The band was playing its final number, Raffaelli recalls, of that night. And to put it bluntly, Hendrix treated his concert performances as a metaphor for an act of love, the intensity ebbing and flowing and then climbing higher and then higher still. The performer's hand was moving on his guitar neck in a way many there wouldn't necessarily want their grandma to see. With the sonic screaming, the crowd roaring, the sweat pouring, guitar strings at the breaking point, suddenly silence fell like a sledgehammer on a pillow. Jimmy later described it as coitus interruptus, Raffaelli recalls laughing, but at that moment he was livid. Jimmy rushes off stage, I follow him, Raffaelli recalls. There's yelling, cursing, angry guitar god faces angry manager who, according to Raffaelli, tells Hendrix the show was getting out of hand and had to end. Then the N-word was used, Raffaelli says, and suddenly he had to get between Hendrix and the man, causing the manager to fall back slightly against a table. Within minutes, several police officers were in the room. According to the veteran photographer, the manager claimed he was assaulted by both Hendrix and Raffaelli. I was the only one who made physical contact, Raffaelli says. Despite the many stories that have Hendrix slugging the man, it simply did not happen. If it had, Hendrix would have spent the night in jail, and it would have been a national news story. Certainly the police were there, as Raffaelli has photographic proof. One cop is shown smoking a cigarette. In the end, Raffaelli says, no one was arrested, but police escorted Jimmy and his entourage, including Hendrix and Raffaelli in one limousine, and Redding and Mitchell in another, to the 99 freeway on ramp. They headed south, never to return. There was no Corvette, he says. There was no hamburger. Others may swear the stories are true. But that's okay. The night Jimi Hendrix came to Bakersfield is no longer an event. It's a legend. And like Hendrix himself, legends take on lives of their own. It was the night of October 26th, and the downtown auditorium was packed with 3,000 young fans. Now 89 and still living in Bakersfield, the man who managed the local venue for 26 years, from 1964 to 1990, sounds quite lucid when he shares his recollections of that night. He hit me all right, he says of Hendrix, but it barely glanced off my cheek. The police immediately grabbed him and took him up to the dressing room. Raffaelli had also told the Californian that Gravis used an ugly racial epithet during the confrontation with Hendrix. The former civic manager again says not true. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, he says. I would never use the N-word with anybody ever. I was taught better than that. In fact, he says, it all happened so fast there was no time for an exchange of words. McAnderson, a long-time Bakersfield police officer, 
who made a career out of being a cop until his retirement at the rank of assistant chief in 1991, often worked rock shows at the Civic. Anderson says he saw Hendrix slug Gravis. Interesting how people can witness an event and recall it so differently, he says in an email, later backed up with a phone interview. Raffaelli's recollection is not accurate. I know as I was the officer who in fact arrested Hendrix that night. I was working the stage right door that leads to the dressing rooms. It shouldn't be surprising at this point that Anderson not only disagrees with Raffaelli's account, he also disagrees with Gravis. Hendrix approached Gravis in an agitated state, Anderson says, and began a heated verbal exchange. Hendrix then struck Gravis in the face with his fist. Standing within two feet of Hendrix, I immediately took him into custody for assault and battery. He was restrained, still in view of the audience for several minutes, while a much more subdued conversation transpired between Gravis and Hendrix. I don't recall the details of this conversation, but it resulted in a delayed decision from Gravis as to whether he wished to pursue prosecution. It was agreed that the extra cost for the venue was guaranteed by Hendrix. He was then allowed to complete his concert. They do agree that the musician struck Gravis, and Anderson says he heard no racial slur. But Hendrix did not resume the concert, says Gravis. Once the power was turned off, it could not immediately be turned back on without damaging the electrical components, and they also differ on why the power was cut. Anderson recalls that Hendrix had exceeded the contracted time he was allowed to play, but Gravis said he was concerned that Jimmy's performance was about to get out of hand. He had heard from other venue managers that the flamboyant guitarist was known for squirting lighter fluid on his guitar and lighting it on fire as feedback roared and the crowd roared back, and that's why he was standing stage right during the finale. There were curtains hanging all around him, Gravis remembers. Can you imagine the fire hazard? It never got that far. Gravis recalls Hendrix grabbing the neck of the guitar as if he were about to smash it. I gave instruction to my employee to cut the sound. And suddenly, the wall of sound crumbled. The show was over. Hendrix, according to Gravis and Anderson, was not charged or taken to jail. Gravis says the punch didn't even leave a mark. I didn't want to give Hendrix that much publicity, he remembers. Rick Kreiser, who was only 15 when he attended the now mythical performance, says he doesn't remember the sound being cut off or the now infamous punch but it wasn't the first time the sound was cut by Gravis mid-performance. Less than one year before, the Civic manager cut the sound during a concert by the San Francisco-based group Jefferson Airplane. Gravis says it happened because concert-goers were being incited by members of the band to dance, including on stage, a situation Gravis says was a risk to public safety. California and Kreiser agree that as hundreds of young fans gathered outside, they began to walk west on Truxton Avenue, ostensibly to protest in front of the Bakersfield Police Department. The police didn't stop them, recalls Kreiser, who is the longtime owner of Carney's Business Technology and organizes music venues in Bakersfield. But at 15, he admits that he, dressed in pinstripe pants, was unsure of why he joined the crowd. We were like sheep, he remembers laughing. I was thinking, how am I going to get out of here? He was also wondering how to explain to his mum why she should pick him up at a different place from where she dropped him off. These were heady times. All Kreiser can be sure of nearly five decades later is he was glad he was there. At both music shows. In the end, it may be impossible to know exactly what happened the night Jimmy came to town. And Hendrix isn't talking. He died less than two years after his Bakersfield performance. Also on October 26th, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music press and underground publications, Rolling Stone, Disc and Music Echo Visa, New Musical Express, and Melody Maker. Sunday, the 27th of October, jam session at TTG Studios, with Andy Summers on bass and Mitch Mitchell on drums and unknown person on piano. Also, on the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following publications, The Kansas City Star, October 27th edition, and World Countdown, October 1968 edition. Monday, the 28th of October, Jimmy gets the paperwork for his Corvette Stingray, but then has two of his guitars stolen. Tuesday, the 29th of October, jam recorded at TTG Studios. Participants include Hendrix, Mitch Mitchell, Jack Cassidy, Lowell George, flute, Graham Bond, piano, and Lee Michaels, organ. Songs recorded... Lover Man, Gloria, Red House, and Jam. Part of this day's session are believed to have been filmed in 16mm color.
without sound. Later that day, Jimmy participates in a telephone interview with Alan Walsh for Melody Maker, published November 9, 1968. While on the evening of the 29th, Jimmy joined the band's Three Dog Night and A B Ski Jamming, until the early morning of the following day. Apparently, the two groups had played the Whiskey A Go Go Club in West Hollywood from October 28 to 31. Until now, the series of photos of Jimi Hendrix jamming, taken at the Whiskey by photographer Ed Kareff, were believed to be dated sometime in November of 1968. However, as a result of research by Hendrix authors, Ben Valkoff and Luigi Garuti, it has been confirmed that they are accurately dated Tuesday, October 29, 1968. Also that day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following publications, The Minneapolis Star and Boston College Heights. Wednesday, the 30th of October, Jimmy records with Air Apparent at TTG Studios. Numbers included Let Me Stay, Magic Carpet, Morning Glory, Mr. Guy Fawkes and Yes I Need Someone. In the afternoon, the experience is filmed at the Benedict Canyon Mansion by the same crew that filmed them the day before, doing a promo clip for All Along the Watchtower. The band is filmed, without sound, posing for the camera, almost as if they were photographed, as they stand and stare into the sun, and includes footage of them driving on the road near the mansion. Also on the 30th, Crosstown Traffic with B-side Gypsy Eyes was released as a single in the US by Reprise Records. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will continue the detailed exploration with November 1968 of the Jimi Hendrix story, including the reception and reviews to the Electric Ladyland album. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Before we go, for those of you still tuned in, we're pleased to share with you the following stunning photographs from the Electric Church photoshoot. Until next time.